For much of its history, this was the Florida landscape. Unspoiled grasslands and timberlands covered much of the peninsula. Today, the Florida landscape is very different. Since the end of World War II, Florida's population has exploded. The 1960 U.S. Census reported that the Sunshine State had a population of 4.9 million and was the 10th most populous state in the nation. According to the most recent census in 2010, Florida is now the fourth most populous state in the nation with 18.8 .8 million people. To accommodate the ever-increasing population, Florida's cities, large and small, have naturally expanded. But this growth is not limited to the city proper, as there are many people who build or buy homes located in largely undeveloped areas. The movement into these areas on the fringe of urban centers, in and around the natural landscape, has created what developers, land managers, and foresters refer to as the wildland urban interface. Wildland urban interface is national title or, or a definition for essentially in simple for where your homes, businesses, structures meet the forest or meet flammable vegetation. It can be rural farms located out in amongst the forest and the grasslands or it can be subdivisions and communities and where the forest and the wildlands meet that. That's the wildland urban interface, those areas that have the potential for, for fires, wildfires to burn homes, structures, businesses, etc. Jim Carls is the director of the Florida Forest Service which is responsible for wildland fire protection that covers 26 million acres in Florida. 6.3 million of those acres fall within the wildland urban interface, which, over the years, has increased as Florida's population has grown. 20 plus years ago, about 20 percent of our fires in Florida, forest fires, wildfires that we respond to, had structures or homes or some component of interface mixed in. Now more than 80% of our fires have urban interface mixes. So it's, in, it's significantly increased over the last 20 years. Wildfires are raging infernos that, once started, spread rapidly and consume everything in their path. And Florida is no stranger to these natural disasters. The worst year on record for wildfires in Florida occurred in 1998. That year, 2,200 fires burned 300,000 acres. 300 homes were lost. 80,000 people were forced to evacuate, and the state spent $133 million battling these fires. 2011 has also been a significant year for wildfires in Florida. Almost 5,000 fires burned 240,000 acres, making it the fourth highest year on record. It was a very tough season. We lost a lot of acres. We did very well. We lost very few homes compared to past years like 1998. We lost 300 homes in 1998. We lost 30-some in, in 2011, but we lost two firefighters this year, which was very significant to us. Very tough issue to deal with. One way to reduce the number and severity of wildfires follows the old saying, fight fire with fire. In this case, using prescribed burns in forests and wildlands, good fire, to reduce the chances of a destructive wildfire and the practice of prescribed fire is as old as Florida. Stan Rosenthal, University of Florida, Leon County Extension Forester, and Lane Green, Executive Director for Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy, are well acquainted with prescribed fire and its history in Florida. So a natural fire is one that would occur like by a lightning strike. Some natural phenomena started the fire. A prescribed fire is where we mimic that natural fire and instead of letting lightning start it or something like that, we actually go out and set it ourselves. And this is done well in advance, uh, planned well in advance, under controlled conditions. And we have professionals that are trained in this and with lots of equipment that they need. And they go for a specific objective, like reducing the fuel potential so we have less of a catastrophic wildfire occurrence, or to burn it so that we preserve or maintain the natural ecosystems of plants and animals that depend on this fire. So you have these natural fires occurring, and when the North American Indians came over, they observed this and saw the abundant game, the 
improved access, control of ticks and things like that. And they saw this as a good thing. So they started doing prescribed burning to mimic that natural fire system. When the European settlers came over, they also saw what the Indians and the natural fire were doing. So they started to mimic that too. And so we kept going this fire dependent ecosystems that we have, the plants that respond to the fire and the animals that utilize those. So up until the 1920s, everything was, uh, was really good on the landscape in Florida. Everybody lived on the land, uh, uh, used frequent fire. They recognized its benefits. But the Forest Service in the uh, early 20s uh, came out with a policy that said, you folks in the South got to stop this crazy practice of setting the woods on fire. It's bad for wildlife and bad for trees. So people started burning less. When that happened, a lot of these fire dependent species began to decline. A classic study done in 1924 to 1930 by Herbert Stoddard, a young naturalist, proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that frequent fire was important to maintaining Florida's ecosystems. So in 1944, there was another deterrent that appeared on the scene uh, for frequent use of fire in the woods, and that was Smokey Bear was born as the uh, poster boy for the bad side of fire in the forest. And he's done a great job of telling us to be careful with fire in the forest. So that was another thing to overcome. In 1958, Tall Timbers was formed and it, its mission was to look at the long-term effects of fire on plants and animals, the good side of fire, the positive benefits of fire. And Tall Timbers helped spread that gospel far and wide. In the 1970s, the state of Florida was beginning to consider using prescribed fire on state lands and tall timbers helped uh, set the first fire on Falling Water State Park. And the ecosystem there today is in great shape and fully functioning. By 1990, Florida took another uh, huge step forward in the use of prescribed fire by the enactment of the Prescribed Burning Act, which said that fire is a necessary and important land management tool. Then in 1996, a revelation, headlines all across the country, the headline was, it seems Smokey was wrong. The subhead says, as it turns out, America's forests need fire to be healthy and free of wildfires. Since reintroducing fire to the landscape in 1971, Florida's prescribed burn program has steadily grown. On average, over two million acres a year are burned in our state, the highest in the country and it has had an effect on wildfires. One example is the 2007 Bugaboo Fire, which started in Georgia before crossing into Florida. The front lines of the fire extended over 20 miles, with flames reaching up 100 to 200 feet into the tops of trees. In 48 hours, it burned over 100,000 acres. We really felt that we may not stop until Gainesville and that could have been millions of acres. And uh, really the saving grace to that entire fire was it, it ran into some very well burned, recently burned um, U.S. Forest Service, the Osceola National Forest. It hit some of their prescribed burns. But it hit those prescribed burns that came down out of the trees and the next day we were able to get some lines on it and hold it there. Without that, if it would have went through the Osceola and went into the big timber um, lands of, of Lake City, private lands of Lake City to Gainesville, that you know, fire could have been three times the size, four times the size that it was. But those prescribed burns on the Osceola National Forest were the key to us catching that fire, the absolute. And that's the key to prescribed fires. Give us the chance when it comes to wildfire, it gives us the chance to grab hold of it. Prescribed burns typically happen out of sight in forests and preserves. The rising smoke in the distance and the scent of burnt wood may be the only indications the general public has that a burn is in progress. However, there is at least one location in North Florida where people can see a prescribed burn as it happens. The Kate Ireland Parkway, a part of US Highway 319, uses prescribed burns annually on its median. The highway connects Tallahassee, Florida and Thomasville, Georgia. In March of this year, the Florida Forest Service, joined with Tall Timbers Research Station, the Florida Department of Transportation, and the Department of Environmental Protection, and a number of other partners to conduct a burn. To determine if conditions are right, the team performs a test burn. The reason for that is to make sure the fire is behaving like we 
think it ought to be based on the weather conditions and fuel loads. And uh, if, it's, if it's acting right, then we go ahead and light the rest of the burn. So it's a, 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 that, that's its purpose. Before you get a fire too big that you have to put out, you do a small one. When we're burning uh, the Cade Ireland Parkway, mediums and right of way, we can't burn up to the blacktop. We need to start at the base of the slope because mowers maintain what's right along the road. What's your location? They're creating a fire break as we're lighting to keep the, the uh, fire from moving up towards the road shoulder and producing more smoke right on the lanes of the highway. Normally, we plow fire breaks, but we don't do that on roadside. So we create a black line with water, and as the fire burns away, then that fire break keeps growing to keep it from going back the way you don't want it to go. Fire always races uphill because uh, the fire is preheating air, hot air rises, it's moving up, and so it pulls the uh, it pulls the fire with it. So you'll notice a change in the fire behavior as it starts up the hill. Uh, live oaks, hardwoods don't like fire, and these are a scenic part of the median. So we're using extra precautions not to get fire too close to the base of them. What we burn on the mediums and right of ways is, is where fire dependent vegetation and uh, trees exist. And longleaf pine is a species that must have frequent fire to reduce the competition around it. So they're burning right up to where the longleafs end. An important factor for any burn is the weather. You want conditions that are dry. The temperature is, will be in the 70s today, good burning weather. Relative humidity is dropping down to around 30% this afternoon, which means fire is going to spread good and you can get through with your burn. On the parkway burn, the right type of wind is also required to keep smoke from crossing the highway and interfering with traffic. The uh, smoke going up and away is very important. The mixing height today is 4,500 feet up, which means smoke will go up before it hits the transport winds in the way, taking it off the highway. And uh, so when all of those factors are in line, then uh, it's, it's a good day to burn. Now we do have a slight west wind and we had smoke blowing towards the highway because the highway is east of us. But with the mixing height being up, it's taking the smoke up and over the highway, which is just perfect. Regardless, fire is a dangerous element and it can change its mind and course. The trained professionals are equipped with different ways of putting out the flames and keeping things under control. Especially on a burn along a highway, we don't want any smoldering uh, remains. And when fire starts to creep up a tree, which it will with a fire scar or you know, maybe one of the birds that peck into trees, make some sap run, that sap will ignite and it'll flame up a little bit. But we don't take any chances on a highway burn. We go ahead and throw, throw dirt on it, or squirt it with water so it doesn't sit there and smoke into the afternoon, into the evening, put smoke on the road after dark. So it, it, we have to do a, what's called 100% mop up. No smoke left that's visible when we leave this burn. The medians and right of way on the parkway are owned by the Florida Department of Transportation. They are on hand to help with traffic control and to observe the burn. Jeff Castor works for Florida DOT. The Department of Transportation manages uh, a lot of landscape in Florida. We manage 186,000 acres of public land. Uh, most of it is used for highway rights away. And uh, sometimes that land passes through conservation lands like this. And uh, and we want to use all the tools that we've got available and prescribed fire is one of those tools that we're just still learning how to use. So I'm here myself learning about prescribed fire and uh, taking pictures. I'm going to share that information with others in the department who can't be here today. As the burn crews wind down their work, Lane Green reports on the success of the operation. Absolutely successful, perfect. It's, it's been safely uh, managed and uh, with the help of the Florida Highway Patrol and the motor carrier uh, folks for DOT and uh, putting out the cones and the warning signs. And people have done really good driving by. They've reduced speed. Of course, everybody's interested in what we're doing. And so that's what we have to be aware of is uh, uh, people rubbernecking to see what's going on. But everybody's been driving safe. The burn crews just uh, uh, did a fantastic job. Our safety officer 
is already going around commending folks for the way they handled themselves and their crews and their teams. The fire may seem like it has destroyed the flowers and the beauty along the highway. This is far from true. After a matter of days, the vegetation will begin to return. As we say, it's beautiful black because longleaf pines don't like competition from hardwood sprouts or things that, that uh, actually will stunt their growth. So they're used to living in conditions like this where there's a single dominant tree species with a grassy understory and that's, that's uh, where they do the best and that's their original natural habitat. If we get uh, a rain right after it, it'll probably in, in seven days you'll be able to see green sprouts without rain, maybe 10, 10 days to two weeks. But uh, it's a great opportunity for the motoring public to see a safe burn, turn beautiful black and start to green up. And, it, and uh, that green up is very fresh, it's early successional growth. And uh, so it gets very lush. And then in the fall, the, the, uh, a lot of wildflowers are triggered by prescribed burns. And uh, so they can see that prescribed fires are safely done, that they have a positive benefit maintaining the scenic landscape and the wildflower explosion. And we hope that we hope that gets people to understand the positive benefits of prescribed fire. That's one of our challenges. And the landscape does recover. One month after the burn, Stan Rosenthal and Eric Stoller from the Tall Timbers Research Station returned to the Cate Island Parkway to see how things have progressed. Well, Eric, I know you as a wildlife biologist and I as a forester, this has really greened up nicely, as it always does. Yeah, it sure has. Um, it's kind of a misconception for most of the public that once a burn occurs that it's a desolate, barren environment. Well, you know, it was interesting. The camera crew, I was riding up with them and they'd filmed the burn and they almost missed it because I said, well, there's the fire. And they're like, where? And, and they, they were just surprised at how well it came back. Yeah, most of the plants and animals in the southeast have evolved with frequent fire and they respond very quickly after a burn. Typically within five to seven days, they're gonna re-sprout and, and start to grow, finish growing. Here's some wire grass, for example, and for four weeks, it's already, you know, 18 inches tall and it's well on its way. Looking good, and, and I see we've got a little contrast between the shortleaf pine and water oak. Yeah, well, the shortleaf pine, once again, is a, is a plant that evolved with frequent fire. It's got a thick layer of bark on it, which protects it from the heat of the fire. This other tree beside it is a water oak, and it typically doesn't live in an upland system. It doesn't do well with fire. It's got a thin bark layer, and over time, the fire will actually get through it and begin to kill it like it's doing here right now. Yeah, it looks like it's not too structurally sound. But I notice here, uh, next to this fungi, we've got some uh, oak sprouts coming up. Yeah, that's another uh, misconception often, is that, that the fire actually kills plants. It, it typically doesn't kill plants. It kills the above ground part of it, and we call that top killing. But the root systems are all intact underneath, and so they send up new re-sprouts and the individual continues to live on. Kind of a rebirth. That's right. Interesting. Well, Eric, I can see this area out here has been burned recently. Yeah, it certainly has. We're now on Tall Timbers Research Station. We burn roughly 50 to 70 percent every year. And by using frequent fire, we get very low intensity fires. Interesting, as opposed to those wildfires that get high intensity. Well, that's exactly right. And intensity is really just the amount of heat that's getting put off by the fire and the amount of fuels that are being consumed produce that heat. And if you look down here, these are our fuels that were driving the system. They're the pine needles and the grasses. And as you can see, many of them did not burn up. Yeah, and uh, I know these high intensity fires, you don't find this stuff down here, these bad wildfires. That's exactly right. Wildfires produce so much heat that it'll literally sanitize the ground and kill the seeds in the seed bank and virtually nothing will grow. The other negative to a wildfire is that it produces enough heat to even kill some hundred year old pine trees. Top kill them and then also damage their roots too. Yeah, it'll completely kill the, the individual. Well, this low intensity frequent fire, look at this uh, four days later and we got this grass coming back. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it, the vegetation responds very well with the low intensity fire and many herbivores and, and deer and turkeys and things like that will come in here and start to feed on these fresh shoots. Stan, we are now standing on another part of Tall Timbers that we burned roughly four weeks ago. Wow, and boy, look at the lush greenness here. You can just really see how a good 
prescribed fire recycles nutrients and it actually raises the pH a little bit and you really get that lush growth come back. Yes, you really do. Right after the burn, most of these plants have the highest nutritional value that they'll have during their entire um, growing season. And the wildlife will immediately come in to, to forage on that high quality. So I bet you don't burn all of the tall timbers at once because of that. Yeah, and that's, that's very important um, from a wildlife standpoint is that you want to burn in a mosaic. You want to have unburned areas and you want to have different stages of regrowth in your burned areas in a mosaic fashion. So the wildlife can move between it. That's exactly correct. Interesting. That's just like uh, ranchers in central Florida where they'll burn different pastures and move their cows between them. Yep, the cows are going to uh, follow the highest quality of forage and that highest quality forage always comes right behind a burn. Well, Stan, we are now standing in a place called NB66. This is a research plot that hasn't been burnt since 1966. Wow, well, this really looks a lot different. I can see by the tall pines, this must have looked like the other area was. It certainly did. Um, before we stopped burning it, we had many of our early successional species, and of which most of those are threatened and endangered, things like bobwhite quail and red cockade woodpeckers, Bachman sparrows, some of those type species used to thrive right here. And ever since it um, became a research plot, you know, they've, they've since disappeared. They left, huh? But uh, did anything else come in? Well, there are some species that like this closed canopy, hardwood type forest. Um, a few birds, a few small mammals, um, and some insects like t uh, ticks and chiggers. Oh, that's unfortunate. You know, the other thing is, I, I know that this might burn eventually, and when it is, it's probably going to be really destructive. Unfortunately, this looks like a lot of what I see in the southeast because they aren't burning like they should. Yeah, there's a lot of unmanaged woods in the southeast, um, and, and a lot of it occurs right at that urban interface, kind of where the city meets the country. And, and, and the folks don't like the smell of the smoke or the ash and whatnot, and so people stop burning those areas. But ultimately, fire is a natural process, and it is going to come across the landscape. And so the reality of it is, do we want prescribed burners burning it under proper weather conditions, or do we want Mother Nature to burn it when it's typically a very dry and hard to put out type fire. Yeah, that creates more smoke, more That's danger, true. more costly. It's, it's a much more controlled situation. So hopefully we can then avoid those catastrophic fires next to people's houses and stuff. So I guess it goes back to good fire, bad fire. That's right. And the state of Florida has made its choice. It has chosen good fire. The Florida Fire Services prescribed fire program is the largest in the nation. And as Jim Carls explains, while preventing wildfires is a big part of the program, prescribed burns are important to the state for other reasons. Prescribed fire is a big deal, big program. Uh, we average over two million acres a year burned in Florida, highest on average in the country. Uh, a year and a half ago we burned 2.7 million acres. That's the highest that anybody knows on record in one state. Uh, so that mitigation, you think about that, that's about of the 26 million acres, you know, that's 10%. So prescribed fire just from the fuel reduction, the hazardous fuel reduction um, part of it is extremely important. But we also prescribe burn for agriculture in this state, and it's a big part of that program. Range management in, in the central and south part of the state is huge in prescribed fire to, to promote them pastures and, and uh, keep their pastures healthy for their livestock. Uh, agriculture, whether you're burning wheat fields or sugar cane, uh, Florida Ag is, one, is the number two industry in the state and without prescribed fire a lot of that industry would suffer. Uh, so there's a number of different reasons we prescribe for burn across the state, not just, not just fuel reduction but for the economy of the state as well. Still, as successful as the Florida Fire Services prescribed burn program has been, the agency recognized the concerns people may have about air quality and the smoke created by prescribed burns, and that these and other issues needed to be addressed. Well, a couple years ago we, we struggled with some of the issues of prescribed fire. We had gone through some pretty severe wildfire seasons, our numbers were going down, population was going up, we were having more impacts um, from prescribed fire and wildfire smoke issues than in the past and we said let's look at this, let's really look at what we're doing and uh, the Division of Forestry then, Florida Forest Service, um, met with Tall Timbers, we talked about it, we thought Georgia ought to be involved, we're, we're almost sister states tied together mm -hmm. 
and the two states came together and we had a, a prescribed fire summit. We did it out at Tall Timbers. And uh, in essence, we brought practitioners and the experts from both states, whether it was air quality, whether it was prescribed fire, whether it was land managers or agencies, uh, come together and said, how do we promote prescribed fire into the future? What do we got to do to make sure that we still have this valuable tool, this management tool for the future? The result of that conference is Prescribed Fire in Florida, a strategic plan. The plan lists seven goals. The first, continue to lessen the impact of smoke from prescribed fires on air quality and traffic. Other goals include educating the public about the use and benefits of prescribed fire, increasing incentives to private landowners who use prescribed fire, and being involved in growth management and other land use planning to ensure the state's new urban areas and prescribed fire can coexist. And uh, we laid out a lot of those things, everything from communication and how we get that message out about the importance and the value of prescribed fire to uh, what are we going to do to make sure our citizens are safe, our air quality is good, and we're prescribed burning as many acres as possible to promote healthy forests, healthy ecosystem, and reduce the threat of wildfire. Some of those goals we're already reaching. Some of them we're working on. Some of them will be ongoing for a good long time. It's a safe bet that Florida's population will continue to grow. And as that happens, people will continue to move into undeveloped areas, building homes and communities, and increasing the acreage within the wildland urban interface. As that happens, the importance of prescribed fire will also grow. Good fire, prescribed fire, will be necessary to help protect people and property from the threat of wildfires, to ensure that the forests that remain are healthy, and to preserve the plants and animals within those ecosystems. I think in Florida the message is better than it is in anywhere in the country. Prescribed fire, when you look at the surveys and stuff, is a very accepted practice in this state. And people that have lived here for any length of time, really realize the value of prescribed fire, the value when it comes to uh, fuel reduction and wildfire threats, the value when it comes to healthy forest and healthy ecosystems, and the value for wildlife management. So it's really our charge today that we have to keep prescribed fire going on to get these low intensity, frequent fires to keep the plant and animal dependent fire ecosystem alive. We all have a common definition of what prescribed fire is. It's a safe way to apply a natural process, ensure ecosystem health, and reduce wildfire risk.